Well, hello and welcome to the Imago Nutrition Podcast. My name is Mark and I will be your host today. And if as 2024 is underway, if you are frustrated with the amount of confusion and the amount of claims about what is or isn't healthy or what certain ingredients mean for your health, I hope this is a fun episode for you. As you saw from the title, we are going to explore 24 nutrition myths that need to die in 2024. And I am long-winded, but I'm going to try to keep this to about 24 minutes. Uh, If we could do a myth a minute, give or take, with a little bit of intro and outro, I think that would be kind of fun, rapid fire. I don't know if I'll be able to do it, so stick around, see if we can button this thing up in around 24 minutes. And so uh, if you have any questions for us that you'd like us to consider as a topic for an episode in the future, please be sure to shoot that to us. You can do so by going to our website, Imago Nutrition, that's I-M-A-G-O nutrition.com slash podcast. So Imago nutrition.com slash podcast. And if you have a question you'd like for us to consider, as I said, uh, we take a look at those inquiries and we weave them into our podcast schedule. So without further ado, I already gave you the primer. As I said, this is going to be a bit of a rapid fire. And so we want to take a look at 24 nutrition myths And my hope with this episode is not just to sort of like make fun of a bunch of myths or show off how quippy and quick I can give you an answer or a rebuttal, but I want it to free you up from the burden of some of these claims, okay? So ultimately, that's my end goal because I know right before Danielle and I started this uh, company, um, we've been both been doing nutrition for uh, many, many years, both of us well over a decade. And um, when we decided to start this business together, uh, we did a social media survey and conflicting nutrition information was the number one frustration felt by people in our uh, admittedly very little uh, social media survey. It was a small survey. It's fine. Uh, but that was a consistent theme. And so With that said and done, I want to clarify very quickly. I'm not going to get into much depth. You're going to get 24 myths. You're going to get 24 realities as a rebuttal, but I'm not going to spend a a bunch of time on each one. And so don't worry. I've done my research. I have the studies, multiple studies in most cases to back up every single uh, reality claim that I'm going to make in response to these myths. All that said and done, I want this to free you up from the burden of all the conflicting information and hopefully set your mind a bit more at ease that nutrition uh, is not nearly as, um, what should I say, Uh, heavy (laughs) as so many people make it out to be. You don't have to understand all these tiny little nuances or else your whole health is going to degrade before your very eyes. And so all that said and done, let's get into the 24 nutrition myths that need to die in 2024. And admittedly, the first six are sort of a clutch. Okay, so let me set up a concept and then let me walk then through six misconceptions. Okay, so. The concept is energy balance. You've likely heard me talk about this before. The only way the body gains weight is by consuming more calories than it expends on average over time, okay? Irrespective of food choices, it does come down to math. If you, at the end of the day, burn 2,000 calories on average and you're consuming 2,500 calories per day on average, the body has 500, let's call them energy points left over. Um, and your body can't create energy, can't destroy energy, can only convert it, or it will store it. Those extra 500 calories are considered a surplus. Body didn't create it, can't destroy it, didn't convert it to work, therefore it will store it for use at a later time. All right. Inversely, the only way the body loses weight is to consume fewer calories than it expends on average over time. So if you burn 2,500 calories a day, and you only consume 2,000 calories a day, you are going to lose weight 100% of the time. It's not a theory. It's not a diet. It's not a hack. This is the first law of thermodynamics, okay? So with that said, the first myth, and I love this one because I hate it so much, (laughs) is that carbohydrates cause weight gain, okay? Now, every time you eat, you gain weight, right? But that doesn't mean that that food is causing immediate fat gain, All right. Carbohydrates are carbon and hydration put together. So when you consume carbohydrates, you're mostly consuming water weight. Okay. So your weight may go up, but that doesn't mean your 
actually gaining weight on average over time. So the number one myth that needs to die once and for all in 2024 is that carbohydrates cause weight gain. Only a positive energy balance where you consume more calories than you expend on average over time, irrespective of the macronutrient distribution or the food choices, the on, only a positive energy balance causes weight gain. Okay. So that's number one. Number two is that sugar causes weight gain. Okay. Again, only a positive energy balance causes weight gain. In fact, I've got the studies to back this up. They've tested both high sugar and low sugar diets while people are losing weight and the results are the same. Okay. So sugar causing weight gain is a myth that needs to die. Remember only a positive energy balance where you consume more calories than you expend on average over time causes weight gain. Number three is that certain foods cause weight gain. So not just a macronutrient like carbohydrate, not just a nutrient like sugar, but this idea that certain foods cause weight gain on average over time. Again, irrespective of your food choices, only a positive energy balance on average over time causes weight gain. Okay. So that's number three. Number four, that certain foods cause weight loss, right? So someone trying to sell you a food may say that this helps lose weight, but I got news for you. If you're not in a negative energy balance, it doesn't matter how quote healthy or nutrient dense or whatever that food is, it's not going to cause weight loss because Ultimately, at the end of the day, it comes down to energy balance. So the fourth myth that needs to die is that certain foods cause weight loss and you should buy those foods. Remember, only a negative energy balance where you consume fewer calories than you expend on average over time causes weight loss. Number five, sort of connected to number one, is that keto causes weight loss, okay? So if you don't know, a ketogenic diet is a very low carbohydrate. Again, it's sort of demonizing, not sort of, it pretty much is demonizing carbohydrates. So I hear this all the time, Mark, keto is great for weight loss. Now people lose weight on keto, but keto is not what's causing the weight loss. What happens is that they then end up consuming fewer calories. This is how every diet quote works if it causes weight loss. It's not because the diet has a name. It's not because you consumed super low carbohydrates, right? it's because you consume fewer calories. So the fifth myth that needs to die is that keto, the ketogenic diet causes weight loss. It does not. Number six is intermittent fasting. If you're not familiar with this, this is just where you go prolonged periods of time, whether that's 12 hours, 14 hours, 16 hours, 18 hours. Some people do 20 hours where they're not consuming and then they just jam pack their meals into that short, what we call a feeding window. Again, some people say, well, intermittent fasting, causes weight loss. It doesn't cause weight loss unless it causes you to enter into a negative energy balance. Okay. But if you only eat one meal a day and you eat more calories than you burn, you're going to gain weight. You're going to gain weight. Okay. That's energy balance. So only a negative energy balance causes weight loss. Intermittent fasting does not. That's number six. All right. So that first six is a clutch. I told you that was going to be sort of a clutch about weight gain and weight loss. Okay, so now let's get into perhaps some more curious claims that are like wildfires, particularly on social media. Perhaps you've heard these in conversations. You've heard you heard them maybe at holiday parties where people are avoiding certain things or not eating certain things because of some of these claims. Okay, the seventh myth that needs to die in 2024 is that seed oils are toxic and or unhealthy. Okay, that seed oils are toxic or inherently unhealthy. All right, research on seed oils is overwhelming. I might have more studies at my direct disposal for this answer than I do even some of the other ones because I've done a ton of research on this recently. So that that research on seed oils is overwhelming, especially because most of them are taking a look at exchanging seed oils or polyunsaturated fats for saturated and trans fats. Let me run down a list. And for every single one of these, I'll show you the study, if not studies, that tested it mechanistically in humans, okay? So they intervened in human studies, took a look at generally a lot of times swapping uh, the seed oils or polyunsaturated fatty acids for saturated fats or trans fats. Here are some of the results. Number one, it has a neutral or positive effect on heart disease, which is the number one cause of premature death, okay? So seed oils have a neutral or positive effect on heart disease when swapped for saturated and trans fats. Neutral or positive effect on inflammation. Okay, they are not inherently inflammatory. 
Okay. Uh, seed oils have a neutral or positive effect on insulin sensitivity. Okay. We see that seed oils can decrease visceral fat. Okay. So you've got two types of fat. One is underneath the skin. One is deep inside the abdomen, the cavity of the abdomen. That's visceral fat. It's actually far more dangerous than subcutaneous fat, which is fat beneath the skin. And we have seen in studies that there is a reduction in visceral fat with the swapping of seed oils, again, for saturated or trans fats. Uh, another uh, outcome is that it improved HbA1c, fasted glucose, C-peptide, and HOMA IR. You can look at what you those are if you would like to Google those. Again, we don't have time. Uh, another uh, outcome is that there is no effect on cancer incidence and that there's a slightly decreased risk of cancer mortality, okay? And to round this all out, even the most dem demonized of these is what's known as uh, linoleic. Oh my gosh, I got it wrong. Uh, linoleic acid, and that does not increase increase cancer risk. Okay, so the, the claim that seed oils are toxic or generally inherently unhealthy is a myth that needs to die in twenty twenty four. Okay, number eight is that artificial sweeteners are toxic. There was a big study that came out recently. I think, you know, all the news headlines carried it. And that's the worst way to learn about nutrition is through a news article. And it said, you know, artificial sweetener is genotoxic. It changes our DNA. It, it damages our DNA. Uh, there's no human evidence that normal consumption has any toxic or genotoxic effects. What we're talking about is a rodent study where they put 500, 600, 800 times the amount of a given artificial sweetener and did see some detrimental effects. But a lot of times those are meaning that you've got to consume 20, 30, 40, 80 cans of soda in order to get that sort of concentration of that artificial sweetener. So the takeaway here is that artificial sweeteners have not been in independently shown inherently, certainly not toxic, let alone uh, generally detrimental. And just remember that the dose makes the poison. That's the case with a lot of things. That's the case with water. That's the case with sun. That's the case with a lot of things, okay? So when you take a look at some of these studies, they say, look, oh my gosh, it damages the DNA. Yeah, because that was at like 800 times the concentration of a couple cans of Diet Coke, all right? So the claim that artificial sweeteners are toxic is another myth that needs to die in 2024. Number nine is that GMOs or genetically modified organisms are bad for you. The reality is that genetically modified organisms are not inherently bad for you. In fact, some GMOs are actually healthier than their quote, natural or normal animal or plant food um, existence prior to modification. Okay. So that's number nine. Number 10 is that gluten is inflammatory. We hear this all the time, but I need you to know that uh, for people that do not have celiac disease or are not gluten intolerant, gluten is not inherently inflammatory. Double bounded protein, uh, you know, you can eat gluten without uh, a medical consideration and it's not causing inherently inflammatory responses in your body. So that's number 10. Number 11 is that dairy is inflammatory. Okay. This one is pretty funny for me uh, because unless you have a dairy allergy or lactose intolerance, dairy has actually been shown to reduce inflammatory cytokines. Okay. To reduce inflammatory cytokines, not to inflame or to increase. Okay. So a lot of demonization of dairy out there, uh, but this claim that dairy is inflammatory is a myth that needs to die in 2024. Okay. Number 12 is a fun one because I feel like every other year we teeter totter like with, with the news. And again, because the news is a terrible place to go for nutrition information. You may be able to relate with this. It seems like every other year eggs are either healthy or unhealthy, right? Like, oh my gosh, eggs are incredible. And all of a sudden, oh my gosh, eggs lead to high cholesterol. Oh my gosh, look at the protein. Oh my gosh, look at the bioavailability. Oh my gosh, look at the saturated fat. And it goes back and forth. Okay. Here's the reality. Uh, let's take cholesterol in particular, because that tends to be the argument about eggs being unhealthy is the cholesterol contained specifically within the yolk. That's why you see a lot of people maybe straining the yolk out or buying egg whites at the store. Here's the reality, okay, which is informed by some terrific recent research, is that there is no direct correlation between dietary cholesterol, so cholesterol you eat via food, 
which yes, cholesterol is only found in animal products. Okay. Not found in plants. Okay. There is no direct correlation between ingesting dietary cholesterol and blood cholesterol. Okay. So one-to-one ingesting cholesterol from food does not increase cholesterol in blood. Okay. Or what's known as plasma cholesterol. Okay. However, however, if dietary cholesterol is consumed in combination with saturated fats and trans fats, which we talked about, the seed oils, then, and by the way, that's pretty typical in the Western diet. So that's something that we need to account for. Okay. So what I didn't just say is consume as much cholesterol as you want. Don't worry about it. If it is paired with saturated fat and or trans fats, which is the case very often in the typical American diet or what we call the standard American diet, SAD, (laughs) S-A-D. That does increase blood cholesterol. Okay. So again, consuming cholesterol does not increase blood cholesterol. However, consuming cholesterol in combination, conjunction with saturated and trans fats does show an increase in blood cholesterol. Okay. That said and done, eggs are terrific. I call them nature's multivitamin. I have them several times a a week um, and uh, they are highly bioavailable. It's some of the best protein you could get. Not as much as people think. It's about six grams per egg. People think like, oh, I had an egg for breakfast. I'm totally good on my protein. That's six grams. If you're an adult, you probably should be like north of a hundred grams in a day anyway. So if you've got six with your breakfast because you had an egg, great. Where are you getting the other 94? Okay. Bare minimum. Okay. So that eggs are unhealthy is a myth that needs to die in 2024. That's number 12. Number 13, that vegetables are unhealthy. And yes, <laughs> this is actually a thing these days. It's not because of TikTok. Never demonize the platform. But TikTok is replete with people. And, and if we're being honest, let's call a spade a spade. It's coming from the carnivore crowd. Okay. The carnivore crowd has to demonize plants. And so what they've come up with is this mantra about plants having defense chemicals. They don't want to be eaten. Okay. And so they've got these defense chemicals. All right. And so therefore vegetables are in particular are unhealthy because even animal based people tend to eat a little bit of fruit because they know they've got to get fiber. I think deep down in their, their belly of their soul, they know they need to get fiber. Uh, so they're like, oh, I'll just have a little bit of like papaya and stuff like that. But they're they're hard up about vegetables, okay? Um, but in the hundreds and hundreds, did I say hundreds of human trials that we have on this? As vegetable intake goes up, all health indicators improve, okay? As vegetable intake goes up, all health indicators improve. We're talking mortality, cancer, uh, heart disease, blood pressure, whatever you want, those things get better, okay? When you increase your vegetable intake, okay? So that's number 13. Inversely, number 14 is that meat is unhealthy, okay? Meat in particular, a lot of times red meat is is really uh, demonized a lot. Okay, so what we see, if you take a look at the studies, you might find a study that says, and I've seen these, right, that as meat intake goes up, cancer risk goes up. I've seen those studies. I acknowledge them, okay? Then you'll see studies where fruit and vegetable intake goes up and cancer risk goes down. I've seen those. They're true. They're out there, okay? So what do you do? If you've got those, let's say, two sets of studies, and it says as meat goes up, cancer goes up. As veggies go up, cancer goes down, okay? so. That's a lot of times the argument on the vegan side of things is, look, you eat, you eat meat, cancer goes up. What they won't tell you is about C, the third bucket of research that shows when meat goes up and fruits and vegetables go up, guess what happens? Cancer goes down at the same rate as it does when fruits and veggies just go up. So what it seems to be quite clear in the evidence is that it's not so much about what's included, i.e. meat, it's more about what's excluded. Because as people eat more meat, they tend to eat less fruits and veggies. But if you can parallel that intake, and by the way, you know, I'm not talking about eating fatty steak every meal every day. We're not talking about eating like an idiot, okay? We're talking about having lean cuts of meat, right? Chickens, turkeys, um, 
red meat with tip top loin or round in the name, right? We're talking about low fat ground beef, ground turkey, eggs, right? We're talking about seafood. We're talking about shrimps. We're talking about sardines. We're talking about salmons, those fatty fishes. We're talking about low fat dairy, low fat or non-fat dairy. That's what we're talking about. Okay. From meat to seafood to dairy, that's what we're talking about. Okay. And we're guarding against some of these realities, but as meat goes up, intake goes up in the research and fruits and veggies go up, we see that cancer risk goes down. So that meat is unhealthy is another myth that needs to die. I'm a little behind. We're only on 15. I'm already at 21 minutes. So here we go. Number 15 is that salt is unhealthy. Here's the reality. Salt slash sodium won't get into the difference. Those two things technically mean something different. We'll just kind of put them together for the sake of argument. Uh, salt is an electrolyte. Okay. It's an essential nutrient necessary for maintenance of plasma volume, uh, acid base balance, transmission of nerve impulses, normal cell function. Too much sodium, too much salt, yes, is unhealthy. Again, the dose makes the poison. Okay. Do most Americans get too much salt? Yes, the average American gets about 3,400 milligrams a day. What we say is in alignment with what's known as the uh, recommended dietary allowance, which is that you should have no more than 2,300. Now, even that sometimes depends on your activity level. Athletes can go well above that because they're worried about far more fluid retention, et cetera. Long story short, if you're a generally average adult like myself, likes to work out, stays active, but I'm not paid to be an athlete, we should be under 2,300 milligrams. So that salt is inherently unhealthy is a myth that needs to die in 2024. Number 16 is kind of fun. Himalayan salt is healthier than table salt. This is a big one, right? I kind of joke that Himalayan salt is proof that women think everything's better if it's pink, okay? So that pinkness is actually just from uh, mineral impurities in Himalayan salt. The research has not shown any um, benefit to Himalayan salt above and beyond your common table salt. And I know that freaks people out because it just looks so much cooler. The Himalayan salt is kind of chunkier. It's kind of pink. It looks organic. Oh, it looks kind of cool. People talk about the, the, the minerals that it has. Their trace amounts, they have virtually little to zero uh, additional impact in your diet. Okay. So that Himalayan salt is healthier than regular old table salt is a myth that needs to die in 2024. Number 17, your gut needs a cleanse, okay? Here's the reality. Nothing you put in your body will force it to cleanse, okay, um, any differently than it already does with its existing mechanisms, okay? It's more about what you don't put into your gut than about what you put in it to allow, again, your body using its natural mechanism. So if you're putting alcohol into your body, right, um, your body's going to cleanse that through natural mechanisms, but what's best for your gut would actually be not ingesting alcohol. Okay. So it's more about what you don't put into your gut, not about something you need to buy or put into your gut. And by the way, the frontline defense on gut health is fiber, get optimal fiber, get north of 25, 30, 40 grams of uh, fiber a day. That's the single best thing you can do for your gut health. All right. So that's number 17 is that your gut needs a cleanse. Number 18 is that detox products, detox your body. Okay. I've been ranting about this one for years. There is no such thing as a detox product. There is no such thing as a detox food. Okay. Or a detox smoothie. Your body is already equipped with detoxification mechanisms. Okay. Nothing you put into your body will force a detox. Okay. We're almost there. Number 19, that your body can only absorb 30 grams of protein per meal. You hear some people say 20 or 30 or 35. Your body can only absorb 30 grams of protein. Okay. That's, it's total nonsense. Your body absorbs, listen, your body absorbs all the protein. It may not utilize it all for things like muscle building. By the way, protein does a lot more than muscle building as we've covered in past episodes. Depending on many factors, right? Like, are you male or female? Are you six foot five? Or are you five foot six? Are you a bodybuilder or are you a marathon runner? Are you, you know, there's all these different individual components as to how much um, protein your body can utilize. But let's talk real quick about exercise. There was a beautiful recent study that came out. I'm just going to quote it. It said, quote, the anabolic response to protein ingestion during recovery from exercise has no upper limit. Okay. So what that's essentially saying is that when you exercise, your body can use an increasing amount of protein depending on lots of individual factors. At some point, 
right? In fact, I think that study even mentioned like up to a hundred grams or that they had tested a hundred grams. And again, if you're a bodybuilder with like hundreds of pounds of lean mass, you can use a hundred grams of protein in a meal. Me, I probably can't at my current body composition, though I'm lean and have a good amount of muscle for a guy who's 5'11 and 42 years old. Uh, but I couldn't, my body's not going to utilize the same amount of protein as a, as a dude that looks like a gorilla. Okay. So the fact the, the claim that your body can only absorb, whether that's 30 or 20, whatever people are saying in a meal, uh, is a myth that needs to die in 2024. Number 20 is that protein causes kidney damage. Unless you have kidney disease, changes in kidney function do not differ. This is directly from another study as well. Kidney uh, changes in kidney function do not differ between healthy adults consuming high protein diet. Okay. And there's parentheses around that in my mind, because what people think is high protein is not nearly uh, what's required. Uh, so anyways, uh, changes in kidney function do not differ between healthy adults consuming high protein diet versus lower or even normal protein diets. Okay. So protein is not inherently um, cause any kidney damage. Okay. Now, if you have kidney disease and you're particularly in the later stages of it, definitely work with your doctor, definitely work with a registered dietitian, reach out if we can help. Uh, but you'd be surprised at how much that myth is prevalent. Uh, and we need to, uh, put it to death in 2024. Number 21 is that avoiding animal products increases lifespan. Okay. There, I'll just go to one example on this one. There are five blue zones. Okay. This is where people around the world live the longest. Okay. So, uh, there's a place in Greece, Japan, Sardinia, uh, Loma Linda, California, and Costa Rica. I think I got all five. Okay. And so those five blue zones are where, and I'm, you've probably seen this out in the news or on a Netflix documentary or something like that. That's where people live the longest. And I've got news for you. They all, they all consume animal products. So we have the five groups of people, the five regions that produce the greatest longevity, and they all consume animal products. In fact, only one of them is vegetarian, which is Loma Linda, California. They're Seventh-day Adventists, so that's a religious sect. Um, they also, by the way, eat predominantly whole natural foods. They exercise. They don't smoke. They don't drink. They don't even drink coffee. Okay, so you can kind of understand why they would have longevity. Okay, so all that's to say, if avoiding animals products would increase lifespan, why is it that the five areas in the world that have the, lo the longest lifespan all consume animal products to varying degrees? Okay, so that's number 21 is that avoiding animal products increases lifespan. Number 22, a vegan diet is inherently more healthy than omnivorous eating. Here's the reality. The blue zones all consume animal products to varying degrees, okay? A vegan diet, there was a recent study that talked about the cardiometabolic effects of vegan versus uh, diets that include meat. And I'm going to talk about this in number 24 just a bit. I might even do a full episode on this. There's a recent study that was done. I have a personal connection to uh, the research team and the lab that it was done on. I'll just give you that because I don't have time to go into it. But it recently tested uh, vegan versus a diet that includes meat. And I can tell you that when you take a look at that study, I can see when you take a look at the data, why the vegan diet um, produced better cardiometabolic results, but it was not the inclusion or exclusion of meat. It was other things like saturated fat. It was other things like exercise. It was other considerations. Okay. But all the way back to the blue zones, if veganism was the ideal diet, um, and more healthy than omnivorous eating, uh, we would see that I think in the blue zones. Okay. Uh, number 23 inversely is that the carnivore diet, because We've had the rise of militant veganism, I think, in the past. Now we're in the middle of the rise of militant carnivorism. And so they claim that the carnivore diet is inherently more healthy than omnivorous eating. And I got news for you. The blue zones all consume ample amounts of plants. Ample. Some would say they're plant forward. They're plant predominant. Uh, I would say technically they're plant based, which does not mean plant exclusive. But all five of those uh, blue zones consume copious amounts of fruits and veggies, whole grains, nuts and seeds, just beautiful foods that we should all be consuming. Okay. Consistently. So the 23rd myth is that a carnivore diet is inherently more healthy than omnivorous eating. And number 24, we're going to do this in just a little over 30 minutes, uh, but give me a little grace because I had an intro and an outro, right? So probably about 24 minutes. So the last one is a fun one. Um, because again, there is uh, there was a new study done on vegan versus uh, meat 
Um, and they created, I think, a docu-series on it. And so that's what I'm flirting with the idea of doing an episode on that study as well as that um, docu-series. So drop a comment. Let me know if you want me to actually do that. I could be convinced. Um, and so number 24 is that documentaries are a good source of nutrition information. Here's how I'm going to boil this down without getting into any examples or names um, or talking about my failed attempts to watch some of these nutrition documentaries because it hurts me so much that I can usually not get past about 10 or 15 minutes of them. However, here's the reality. Documentaries are a work of entertainment, okay? They are biased at best. At worst, they are complete works of fiction, okay? Um, and so I long learned, in fact, I learned in journalism class that the easiest way to bias a piece of work is not to lie. It's just to not tell you all the truth. And documentaries, especially in the nutrition space, consistently pick a stream, they pick a thought, they pick an end idea, and they work through sometimes even scientific research to that end to convince the viewer of the perspective they had before they even created the documentary, okay? That is very different from the scientific method. That is very different from how we should approach these ideas. All that said and done, that documentaries are a good source of nutrition information is the 24th nutrition myth that in my opinion, my humble opinion, uh, needs to die in 2024. So with that, I hope you've enjoyed this. This is, again, was a bit of a rapid fire. We're coming in at about 32 minutes right now. And so if we could help you with any of this, if you have any questions, because perhaps uh, demystifying some of this stuff has brought up some other questions that I wasn't able to answer, please don't hesitate to reach out. You can go to our, uh, again, our website, imagonutrition.com slash contact. There's a form there. You can shoot me a question. You can get in contact with us there. If you've enjoyed this, please subscribe to the episode or to the website. Uh, nope, that's not it. Let's go with three, which is the podcast. Okay, so please subscribe to the podcast um, and drop a review. Let us know how we're doing, any questions you have. And then we would love it for you to share with the friends. If you've got some friends that have been thinking about or hearing or arguing about some of these myths, uh, just do us a favor. Shoot uh, this episode to them. We would love to help as many people as possible. You can follow us on social media. I am personally ramping up my TikTok usage. So if you're on TikTok, be sure to follow us at Imago Nutrition. That's I-M-A-G-O Nutrition. If you're not on TikTok, no worries. We're on Instagram. We're on Facebook, et cetera, et cetera. And as always, big thank you to our friends over at the Happy Pill Band for our theme song, Think About Food. And I hope your 2024 is off to a terrific start. We'll see you soon. Bye.